Hey there guys, Vostowo here. Today what I got for you is a video on the Corrected English Type Box Respirator. Alright, so uh, to get into the history, I'm actually going to briefly summarize the history of the Bureau of Mines Box Respirator first. So when entering into the First World War, the United States military was using a multitude of different foreign masks, including the British Small Box Respirator, uh, the French M2, that is Mask of the Second Army and not Model 2, uh, and also the French Tissot apparatuses. And that's not particularly desirable for industrial and self-reliance reasons. So the U.S. Bureau of Mines went to work designing a gas mask of their own, uh, and what they came up with was a clone of the British small box respirator that ended up being designated the Bureau of Mines box respirator. The Bureau of Mines box respirator and its type A filtering canister were sent to the British for testing, who found that the face piece's rubber was vulnerable to penetration by more abrasive poison gases like chloropicrin, and the filtering canister had a type of soda lime in it that tended to clump up and actually stop uh, the user from breathing. So they were completely unsatisfactory and unfit for combat use. So the U.S. military would have to go back to the drawing board. Luckily, the U.S. military realized that the issues present in the Bureau of Mines box respirator were not inherent to the box respirator, but instead to that specific design. Because the U.S. military entered into the war so late, they actually got a bit of a technological advantage. While every other country had to develop their own masks and figure out what worked by themselves, the U.S. military could actually just piggyback off of every other country's research by just looking at the masks they produced. And the British small box respirator seemed to be the most promising of the bunch. It wasn't disposable like the French M2 was, uh, it didn't have a massive canister that would replace your backpack like the uh, Tissot apparatuses, and the canister was actually large enough to be satisfactory, unlike the German GM-15 and GM-17. Oh, and I guess also the ARS. It also had inlet and exhale valves for increased efficiency, and looking back, it was absolutely the right choice. So yeah, while they uh, scrapped the Bureau of Mines box respirator, well, I guess scrapped isn't the right word, they were mostly repurposed for training and whatnot, uh, they kept the idea of the small box respirator. And from there, they started upgrading their design. They reinforced the rubber of the face piece to make sure that chemical weapons like chloropicrin couldn't penetrate it. They also improved the construction of the lenses, and they, they also modified the angle tube and head harness and also the canisters. Specifically relating to the canisters, the Type A was actually a segregated design, which means that the charcoal and soda lime were actually separated into uh, different segregated layers within the canister. With the adoption of the Type B canister, they actually did away with that by mixing the absorbent together, which resulted in a more effective filter. Then the Type-C canister would be adopted, which would finally do away with the Easton A25 green soda lime that caused the clumping issue. And then the Type-D would be developed, which added cotton smoke filters. After that was, of course, the Type-E, which added a removable inlet valve at the bottom. That, of course, isn't to say that previous models didn't have inlet valves. Uh, the only difference is that this inlet valve was removable. And then, once again, after that, and trust me, this is the final canister, for now, the Type F would be adopted. Uh, the previous five canisters were, uh, well, all the same size, and they were quite large. And the Type F was actually just a shrunken down, a little canister, of this size. So while this reduced greatly the uh, lifespan of the canister, the smaller size proved to be much more practical for actual warfare. So finally, after all of this developmental work, the corrected English type box respirator would be adopted in October of 1917. Uh, and I briefly want to uh, take a moment to uh, dissect that name a little. In that name, corrected is not actually the adjective for English. Instead, it's modifying English-type box respirator. And that's because, well, the Bureau of Mines box respirator could be considered the English-type box respirator. Now, I want to state 
that the Bureau of Mines box respirator was never called the English type box respirator, and if I find any of you is calling it that, I will stomp you until you stop breathing, but it could be considered the English type box respirator. And so this, being the corrected version of that, is the corrected English type box respirator. But anyhow, these were actually sent to the front line in massive numbers. Uh, they ended up producing millions of them. Predominantly, they were used by the U.S. military, but numbers of them were also sent over to the Italians and Russians. That isn't to say that they didn't have their own masks. They did, but they just had difficulty producing enough for their militaries. So they acquired some from the U.S. It's also worth noting that both countries were using the British small box respirator as well, so these were truly an excellent addition to their stocks. As the war went on, the corrected English proved to be satisfactory, but it also could have been better. And this was noticed by the military, who actually went and revised the mask yet again. They gave it larger defogging pockets, as well as a new design of head harness. As I'll show you later, the corrected English used a five-point head harness, which does a pretty terrible job at distributing weight equally. Well, all five-point head harnesses do. So to fix that, for what would become the Richardson Flurry Cops, the U.S. military designed a six-point head harness. And then, in February of 1918, the Richardson Flurry Cops, with its better defogging pockets and uh, head harness, would be adopted. But what's interesting is, despite this thing being intended to replace the corrected English, I don't actually know if the Richardson Flory cops ever made it to the front lines. Uh, in no photos can you actually confirm that it is the Richardson Flory cops, because they're usually wearing a helmet if they're wearing a gas mask, right? So you can't see the head harness. And while they also did expand the defogging pockets a little, you can't really tell which is which in, you know, period photos, because, you know, they made these both in five sizes with also wide variants of each, so that's not really a measure you can go by. Even if you're not just studying old photographs, there's no documents, uh, at least that I've been able to find, that confirm whether or not this thing was actually sent to the front lines. Uh, so that means that the only evidence that I've personally seen is carriers that have been drawn on. And it's like, well, that could just very easily be faked. Yo, this is a editor about Stowo. I just wanted to pop in and elaborate a little bit more on the RFK mystery, because I'm not sure if I explained myself enough uh, in that last segment. So I did a bunch of research on this, and uh, the main thing was looking for just any sort of documentation that refers to the Richardson Flory cops, like, at all. And uh, I actually found a few. Just a few. Specifically, I found a lot of secondhand sources. And what's interesting is all of these secondhand sources seem to cite that there were over 3 million of the RFK-type masks produced. Now, that seems like a lot of masks to be produced to never be photographed outside of a laboratory or uh, be confirmed to have made it to the front lines, so I want to look into that number a little bit. And I believe that I've found the source of that, because uh, it seems that they're all citing Amos Alfred Fry's chemical warfare. And yes, that is specifically Brigadier General Amos Alfred Fry's of the Chemical Warfare Service. In his book, he cites specifically that by the end of the war, the United States had produced over 3 million masks of the small box respirator type. Now, that includes both corrected Englishes and RFKs. But other than that, I couldn't find any sort of actual reference to how many of these specifically were actually made. Every source that actually talks about production numbers gets it wrong and includes corrected Englishes. So I guess ultimately, uh, my point here is that I'm not sure of the extent that these were actually manufactured and the extent that they made it to the front lines. Now, I'm sure that since they were officially adopted, at least some of them made it, but they were massively, massively outshadowed by the corrected English. 
So I'll definitely continue looking into this in the future, and who knows, maybe I'll do an update video specifically about the RFK. But for now, I'm going to let past bots duo take it over. However, we do know that the corrected English would be used until the end of the war and also slightly after until the adoption of well, the M1 service mask. Speaking of the end of the war, at this point, uh, U.S. stocks of corrected Englishes would be either repurposed for training, surplused off, or just kept in storage where they would just eventually rot. Among those that got surplused, a lot of them would just be used in the way they were for different industrial purposes. Uh, I have heard accounts of firefighters actually using these in the post-war era, uh, leading to, well, some rather serious injuries since these weren't intended for smoke. Uh, also, a number of them were converted into industrial masks. In fact, I have seen uh, a photograph from the 20s of a corrected English that was actually converted into a half mask for uh, gold storage, actually, which is really, really cool. Also, if you've seen my video on the BRL riot mask, uh, I have seen an example of a Richardson Flory cops converted to work with those shiny filtering canisters that come with those kits. Uh, that's also insanely cool. But you know, with production of these being over, they would slowly just fade away, get destroyed, you know, just rot, uh, get thrown away. You know, everything that happens to old gas masks happened to these. And also the industrial market stopped caring about it because, you know, we're entering into the era of the Burel Cops, for one, uh, which is just like, as an industrial mask, just way better than that. So yeah, as time wore on, they would just kind of fade away and become a collector's item. Anyhow, that is all the history that I want to talk about for now. Uh, we'll get back into it later, but why don't we start taking a look at the mask itself? So here it is. As you can see, the face piece is made out of a rubberized cloth, and it uses a twin lens design. And the lenses are actually pretty interesting. Uh, you see on the one over here, it's just a single layer of celluloid plastic. But originally, they were intended to be what's called triplex glass. Triplex glass being two layers of glass with a layer of celluloid plastic between them. The United States actually ran into a lot of difficulty producing the triplex uh, lenses, uh, resulting in a vast, vast majority of the lenses that were rolling off of the assembly line to fail inspection and be discarded. And that problem was actually choking up production quite a bit. So until they could design a machine that could more reliably produce these triplex lenses, the U.S. went and started manufacturing these much more simple uh, celluloid plastic lenses. Hey, this is uh, Editor Botstowo again. Uh, I almost forgot to mention that there was a third eyepiece design used with the corrected English. What they are is this simplified lens frame design with the single layer of celluloid, much like in these lenses. Now, I don't know what's up with this style of eyepiece. Um, they pop up quite scarcely, actually, uh, but I have seen them pop up a few times. And since I don't really have any information on them other than they exist, I'm not even going to really try to guess as to why they existed. Moving down south a little bit, you've got your angle tube. Some of you might be asking what an angle tube is, and well, it's got kind of a loose definition. Typically, it is a tube that serves more than one respiratory function, like in this case, it being the inlet channel and where the air passes to the exhale valve. But anyhow, as you can see, it is where the mask connects to the 10-inch rubber and stockinette corrugated hose and to the exhale valve and exhale valve guard. Unfortunately, that example I was just showing you does not have its exhale valve, but this much more crispy example does have it. So as you can see, here is the M1 flutter valve. The way a flutter valve works is by, well, inflating like a balloon, and then when the valve is full of air, these little slits on the side open up, allowing air to actually pass through. Typically, the M1 flutter valve is discolored black, uh, 
so a lot of people tend to believe that they were originally intended to be black, but that is not actually the case. Instead, they were originally this reddish-brown gum rubber. Uh, this example actually retains a little bit of that color, so I hope you guys can see it. As you can see on these two other examples of an M1 flutter valve, they were not actually solidly manufactured. Instead, they were manufactured as sheets that were then folded into the right shape and then vulcanized at the seams. And because of that, they are all just a little bit different. Moving on from the XL valve, we can go to the exhale valve guard. And as you can see by what I've got in front of you, there are actually two different types. Over here on the left is the early type, and over here on the right is the later one. Now, the idea is the same for both. They're both just brackets that protect the XL valve from damage, but they differ a lot in construction. As you can see, the earlier type is a lot more sturdy, a lot more, well, robustly manufactured, and has a single screw right here that passes through the gap between the hose uh, connection and the XL valve uh, on the angle tube. The XL valve guard's material also passes over the top of the angle tube, and then the screw that we saw from the other side terminates right here with this nut. Now, it seems that these weren't very cost productive, so later on in the war, they developed a more streamlined version. It's definitely less robust, you get less shielding out of it, but still, it's about all you need. And instead of there being a uh, screw that goes through this gap right here, the screws go into these new molded into the metal wall. Uh, presumably this is cast. So it's cast into the metal. There is a hole right there, and that's on both sides. So you can put a screw right through there, and then it locks in place with one of these square nuts. Oh, and I guess it's worth showing you at this time that the angle tube does just lead to the mouthpiece. There's nothing special going on between them. It literally just goes straight through. We'll talk about the mouthpiece more later on. So going back to this hose for a second, as I mentioned earlier, it is a 10 inch corrugated rubber hose with a stockinette outer layer. And it is wire and taped to both the angle tube and your filtering canister. And this fact has led to the rumor that these things were actually disposable. Uh, I've heard this said about both the British small box respirator and the corrected English. However, that's not true. People will often say that you couldn't change the filter because it is wire and taped. Now, it's true that the soldier couldn't do that, but when the canister was used up, they would turn it into, well, their quartermaster or someone, and they would actually send it to where it would get replaced. So definitely not the most efficient system in the world, but that's the system that was used all throughout, well, World War II by the U.S. military up until the adoption of the M9. And also, the Chemical Warfare Service did realize that that wasn't all that efficient, so they developed a form of threaded filter coupling. Uh, it didn't seem to go anywhere, but it did technically exist. Well, exist solely in an experimental phase. Anyways, getting into the filtering canister, this is a Type G. Specifically, this is an early Type G, which you can tell due to the lack of any sort of flourish embossed on the lid. The Type G canister was adopted on January 1st of 1918. It's quite similar to the earlier Type F canister, except where it reduces the number of cotton pads by two. So while this did technically reduce effectiveness against particulate threats by a little bit, uh, it greatly reduced breathing resistance. It does, of course, retain the replaceable inlet valve, which was adopted with the Type E canister, and all the information on the production of the filter is painted right on the bottom. While the Type G would continue to see use until the end of the war, production would actually stop at some point after the adoption of the Type H. The Type H was actually entirely identical to the Type G, with the only difference being a switch from the uh, Astoria purple soda lime to A25B pink soda lime. This resulted in a significant increase in effectiveness, which made the Type G one of the most effective canisters of the war. Maybe even the most effective, if we're only including uh, stuff that was actually adopted. 
The CWS uh, did a lot of testing with the Type H uh, compared to other countries' canisters, and this thing really blew all of them right out of the water. It's really incredible the amount of, uh, well, service life and the PPM that it could handle just in such a small package, well, for the time. Something you might have noticed is that these are all painted yellow and they are all the same dimension. And because of that, it's pretty hard to tell them apart. And this was something the CWS also noticed. And so they started putting the information on the top of the canister, embossed right into the metal. On the early Type G here, there is no markings on the lid. But on this flat-topped Type H, there is a serial number or lot number or something with an H below it. Uh, it's very hard to see. I'll give you a close-up later. And then on the other side here, there is a manufacturer's stamp, this one being Hero. Then on this late Type G, which is the same as a normal Type H, there is the serial or lot number. I believe, uh, I believe it's a lot number. Uh, followed by an X and then a G, and then also again on the other side there is the manufacturer stamp, this one being Canco. Focusing on the flat-topped Type H, uh, there is no chance in hell I think you're gonna see the uh, <laughs> information stamp there. Just trust me, there is one. Then, on the other side of the hose nipple, that is the actual real term for that, there is the manufacturer stamp. This one, as I mentioned earlier, was manufactured by Hero, the most common manufacturer for American filtering canisters during the war. Uh, I should note that that is just the canisters and not the contents. There were a few different manufacturers for canisters during the war, all with their own unique stamps, and I will put a little infographic that I made right now. Golly, that was awesome, wasn't it? Anyways, here is a late Type G. You can actually see this, well, information stamp here. It has 94XG. The 94, I believe, is a lot number. And then the G is the designation, meaning this is a Type G. Then, below here, it says Canco. Earlier, I was fawning over the effectiveness of these canisters, but it should be noted that that came with a giant trade-off. Specifically, that trade-off was some pretty severe breathing resistance. And since that was kind of a major issue, that led to the development of the Type J. The Type J differs from the Type H by there being about, well, this much just empty space in there. Uh, there is a spacer right here that the packing spring is connected to. I will put a diagram of both of these canisters in the video now so you'll see what it looks like. So while the effectiveness of the Type J was lesser than that of the Type H, the Type J had a much lower breathing resistance, so it was considered the superior canister. However, the Type J did have issues with the packing spring, so shortly after its adoption on July 1st of 1918, the Chemical Warfare Service would start developing the Type L. And while I don't have one to show you today, uh, they're literally just the same thing, but with an updated packing spring. So, as you can see, the Type J's canister is externally identical to the other two we looked at today. And it includes the embossment on the lid. And as you can see, there's a J right there, making this a Type J. Then, the Canco there, and what's interesting about this canister in particular, is an extra Canco stamp on the waist of the canister. This wasn't always done. While the Type L was the last of this line of canisters, their story doesn't end with the corrected English and RFK. In fact, they were used rather frequently on America's experimental Tissot masks of 1918. For instance, my example of the Akron Tissot, which I don't feel like getting out right now, uses a Type J. The reason I bring up their use with the experimental Tissot masks is because I actually want to talk about a specific issue with these canisters. 
even when brand new, these things leaked their contents horribly. And if you've ever breathed through one of these, like I have, you'll probably know that, because the charcoal and soda lime that gets brought up when you inhale gets all up in your mouth, and it's disgusting, and like, it's just nasty. But anyhow, on the Tissot masks, that was actually kind of a giant problem. You see, these things were being developed specifically to reduce dimming from fogging, but it was still causing significant dimming because this air that was full of charcoal dust and soda lime dust was being sprayed over the lenses, which resulted in a different type of dimming. And because of this, a significant amount of development went into ensuring that the canister that would inevitably replace these, which ended up being the M1 felt filter, would not have that issue. And ultimately, they succeeded. The M1 felt filter didn't have this issue, and wound up being an excellent canister for the time. But moving on from their military use, the most eagle-eyed of you might have noticed that these are almost identical to a lot of post-war American industrial filtering canisters. It's especially noticeable when you've got them side by side. On the far left here, you've got your Type J, and then in the middle, you've got two MSA manufactured canisters, and then on the right here is a Davis canister. As you can see, they are all the same dimensions, and they've all got this ribbing design all up the sides, but they are slightly different on the MSA ones to make room for stamps that say uh, what specific type of canister they are. These similarities are not coincidental. When the US military adopted the M1 felt filter, the canister was entirely different, so they no longer needed the tooling for this style of canister. And so, to help recuperate some of the money put into this rather expensive war, all of the tooling was sold off to a bunch of industrial safety companies who were looking to get into respiratory protection. Now let's take a moment to take a closer look at this Type J and this Davis canister. You'll notice that even the decorations on the lids of the canister are exactly the same, with the exception of the different manufacturing stamps on the lids. If you look real closely, you can see that there is some manufacturing info just stamped right into the lid there. And this is what the manufacturing info on the lid of an MSA canister looks like, well, more specifically some MSA canisters, because they don't all have this. Also, you'll notice that the hose nipple is completely the same. However, on the side you'll notice that there are little D-rings on swivels meant for integrating into a harness, like on this MSA example. And as I mentioned earlier, they've all got these corrugations going up the sides, but they have on the MSA canisters a little break from it to fit in the canister protection type. And then on the bottom, you can see the different types of inlet valves. On the Type J and on the MSA ones, they are identical, except for the fact that the MSA ones cannot be replaced. But on the Davis one, they use a different style of inlet valve that can be replaced. And with that, I think we can finally move away from the canisters. If it seems like I went into way too much detail on these canisters, sorry about that, it's just because I wrote an entire unreleased book on the topic. Let me know if you guys want me to actually release it. Who knows, maybe I'll put some digital copies on my uh, merch store, link in the description, or maybe I'll make a free audiobook for you guys. Or maybe both, I don't know. This video is allegedly about the corrected English, so why don't we get back to it, because there's some more details that I would like to cover. Firstly, on our section on the eyepieces, I forgot to mention that this thing does have a pretty novel fog clearing mechanism. I talked about it in a YouTube short, but I'll talk about it here too. This thing actually has defogging horns in the same way that the Zelensky Command does. They're actually located right here and right here. It's got two of them, one for each lens, and the way they work is you turn them inside out and then actually physically wipe off the fog from the lenses. While these were issued with anti-dimming kits like this one, they serve a fundamentally different purpose than defogging horns. That's because anti-dimming kits are for fog prevention, while defogging horns are for clearing fog. But we'll take a look at the anti-dimming kit later. Moving on to the head harness, the corrected English uses a five-point design. This is the earlier design of head harness that cannot be easily adjusted. To tighten it, you have to use a safety pin, and to loosen it, you have to 
actually use extra material and sew it in. However, this extension is not something I've seen used very often. On the rear here, you can see the incredibly rudimentary head pad. Quite literally, it's just where the non-elastic forehead strap meets the two elastic ones and is just sewn in place. And speaking of being sewn in place, this doesn't have any sort of fancy tab and buckle system. Instead, the head harness is also just sewn to the mask. Here I've actually got an example of the later style of harness. As you can see, all of the straps are actually adjustable with a buckle. Something interesting about this head harness is that it actually adjusts from the head pad and not from the peripheral of the mask. Over the last century, that design of adjustment has almost entirely fallen out of favor. I say almost because there's probably just some mask that I'm not aware of that still does this. Some of you guys might have noticed that these are actually the exact same buckles that are used on the Avon M53. It's also the exact same strap width that we are still using today. And I believe that's all I want to show you on the exterior of the mask, so why don't I show you the inside? All right, here we are on the inside. You can really see on this example the rubber backing of the canvas. I brought out my most beautiful example specifically for that. And so this is pretty much what these things would look like on the inside when they were new, except for the color of the lenses and how messed up the mouthpiece is. I don't believe I mentioned it earlier, but these lenses are just supposed to be clear. The yellowing is just due to age. But we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves. Why don't we move outside in, starting with the peripheral seal? Well, if you can even really call it a peripheral seal, it is just the stockinette folded in on itself and glued in place. Moving in, you can see the nose clip and the mouthpiece. Now, I figured I would give you guys a closer look at both since I just have these components. Let's start out with the nose clip. As you can see, it is just a piece of wire in a circle looped into this uh, stockinette pocket that would just be glued onto the inside of the mask. The reason the wire is in that loop shape is so that when you pull the nose pads apart, which are rubber, but these are entirely solid, it actually pulls them back together with quite a bit of force. You can also see the rather interesting texturing there so that they don't slip off your nose. They've also got these manufacturing stamps, and I'm not exactly sure how to read these. They're also found on M1 flutter valves. Oh yeah, and you can't actually remove the spring from this pocket because they'll have either this little bit of sewing there, or sometimes it's a rivet. And then when we take a look at this snorkel, as you can see, it is just a pretty normal style of mouthpiece. So I'm sure some of you guys are wondering why they built it like this. And there are some good reasons. For one, peripheral seals at the time weren't all that reliable. So if you can force someone to only breathe through the filter and completely restrict them from breathing otherwise, that makes it a lot more safe. However, this design did actually present a pretty major issue. Not only is it incredibly uncomfortable, but it also makes it a lot more difficult to speak. Another issue is that it completely precludes Tissot deflectors, but that's not important right now. Anyhow, the doctrine for actually speaking while wearing one of these things was to take a deep breath, hold it, remove the mouthpiece, but not your nose clips, say what you need to say, then replace your mouthpiece, and then keep breathing normally. So there is actually quite a bit of work that goes into just saying whatever you need to say. And this is right as voice diaphragms on gas masks were just becoming a thing, so this thing absolutely does not have one. And also, you know, there's a war on, so people are shooting, there's bombs going off and all that. So it's going to be very difficult to hear someone even after they do that whole routine that's required to talk. All of that together meant that communication while wearing the corrected English or the Richardson Flurry Cops was really difficult. Oh, and something I forgot to mention in the original history part of this video, I'm sorry I'm getting into history yet again, but I believe it was MSA that did this, but they actually took the angle tubes, hoses, you know, valve guards, and mouthpieces, and uh, completely removed them from the masks, and uh, just tied a... Uh, a set of nose clips to them. And so these would be 
connected to full-size like industrial canisters like the ones I was showing you earlier and they were just like a mouthpiece respirator. Well I believe that is all there is to talk about when it comes to the interior so why don't we talk about the kit. We'll start with the anti-dimming kit. These kits are essentially little tins that contain a stick and a cloth for preventing fogging. The instructions are on the outside of the little can, but what it is is basically just you scribble a little bit with the stick on the lens, on the inside of the lens, and then use the cloth to rub it in. The lid just comes off uh, with a little bit of force, and that exposes your cloth and your stick. Being very gentle, because these are very old, you can pull the cloth out of the can and unravel it, and there is your stick. As you can see, the stick is wrapped in a bit of foil, and you would actually tear off little bits of that to expose the stick so that you can use it on the lens. And then when it's time to put it away, you put the stick back in place, then wrap the cloth around it. This cloth unfolds a whole lot more, but I don't want to do that. But then you stick it inside your can, and put the lid back on. Moving on, we'll talk about this little envelope that is found tied with these little cords to the canister's hose nipple. As it says on the front, it contains the instruction card, the record card, and tape for repairs. It doesn't say anything on the rear. To get the little booklet outside of the envelope, you just pull on it there. Typically, it will stay tied to the hose nipple. I just untied it on this example for ease of demonstration. On the front and back covers, you have the instructions for wearing the carrier and operating the mask. On the inside, there is your record of use. You can never really be 100% sure if the stuff that's in these cards is fake or not, but this one is filled out just a little bit. And on the other side of the booklet, you have your plaster tape for repairing the mask. A common misconception is that this tape is used for actually replacing the filter, but it is not. This is solely for repairing tears in your face piece. The soldier that would wind up using the mask would never change the canister themselves. But anyhow, we can actually remove it, and you can see what that looks like. At this point, I should mention that, just like everything else in these kits, the envelope and its contents also varies a bit. For instance, you can see that on this one on the right here, it does have the safety pin for adjusting the head harness. Not all of them came with them. And opening it up, you can see that the design of the instructions is a little bit different. That's also visible on the rear here. Opening it up, you can see how the safety pin was stored, and that even all of this varies. While this is a little bit off topic, I figured I should probably bust out the Akron Tiso and show you the special variant of that card that was made for the Tiso kits. Opening it up, you will see that the instructions are entirely different. That makes sense because due to the lack of nose clips and the snorkel, a lot of the instructions on the regular cards would be completely irrelevant. And before we move on, I'll show you what the inside of this looks like. And yeah, I did kind of uh, bring out the AT just to flex, because I mean, like, look at this thing. It is just so dang cool. I love it. All right, but getting back on track, let's talk about the last thing in these kits. These right here are examples of the M1 chest carrier. As the name implies, when the mask is being used, it would be worn on the chest. However, while being worn while out marching or something, it would be carried on the left side of the waist, with this side facing out, this side would be up against the body, and the strap would go across the body up to your right shoulder. So yes, that means that this side is the front of the carrier, while this side is the rear. Even while you're wearing it at the chest, the side with the flap is up against your body. Let's talk about the strap for a moment. You might have noticed that's got this interesting spearhead uh, fastener here, and these hooks on the side of the carrier. This was done so that while you were wearing it at your waist, you could very easily bring it up to the chest by hooking these together. Yeah, just like that. 
You'll also notice that there are two adjustment buckles on this strap. That is so that one of them can be adjusted to fit you correctly while you're wearing it at the waist, while the other one can be adjusted so that it fits you correctly while you're wearing it at the chest. Moving on from that, there is also this quite long, thin cord emerging from the side of the carrier. This is a retaining cord that is meant to wrap around your entire body, where it is then tied to the D-ring on the other side of the carrier, keeping it from bouncing around too much while you're wearing it. Well, I said it was a D-ring, but this isn't always the case. As you can see here, sometimes they are more square. Oh, an important detail that I completely forgot to mention is that these carriers are made out of a waterproof duck canvas. This can make them rather stiff, like this example. Anyhow, the carrier opens with this flap and these two lift the dot fasteners. Also on the flap is a sizing stamp that correlates with your face piece. Opening it up, you can see the manufacturing info. This one being manufactured by Simmons in 1918. This right here is a little bit of carrier art. Again, I'm not sure if that's real, but this carrier, if real, did belong to the same guy as that card we looked at earlier. Uh, also, it belongs to that same face piece that looks really nice. If we take a look inside, you can see that it is divided into two chambers. This side is for your mask, and this side is for your canister. Oh, let's see if we can focus. Yeah, there we go. At the bottom of the canister side, you can see the canister spring. It's really just a spring that keeps the canister off of the bottom of the carrier, ensuring that the material of the carrier doesn't block the inlet. You'll also notice some little holes in the divider, improving airflow. Oh, and also some leftover paint from the canister. And with that, I think this is where I will end off the video. Sorry this one took so long to come out. I've got responsibilities outside of this, and also this was kind of a longer video. I haven't yet seen how long this video is. Uh, all put together, but I feel like it's gonna be long. So yeah, it's just kind of difficult to find the time to record all of this. Speaking of this video being long, I will make this the first ever brief Botstowo outro. So thank you guys very much for watching. I will see you in the next one, whatever that is.